welcome to Confidential Conversations, everybody. And this is the woman that I am so excited to have back on our podcast is Lorena Troy. She's an author. She was episode 46, if you recall, with a a tragic, tragic, tragic story that um, she's has a positive ending and has done wonderful things because of it. But unfortunately, the tragic story doesn't just happen to her. It's happened to people all over our country. And um, that's pretty much what we're going to be speaking about today. So without further ado, Lorena, welcome back to Confidential Conversations. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, I I love speaking with you. Your story is gut-wrenching for any human being out there, let alone a mother. Um, to have to go through it again with you is is still going to hurt just as much. I'm sure every time you tell it, it hurts just as much or you wrote about it in the book. Yet this the I still don't think enough people know that this happens until it happens to them. Exactly. And um, that's pretty much why you're here. You, you know, you're going to recap your story. Tell us again what had happened. And because of these terribly unfortunate circumstances, you were asked to speak on a current Netflix documentary that's out covering the same type of tragedy. Um, so we'll go into discussing that further as well. But before any of that, let's go into telling everybody, Lorena, tell us your story. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, in 2015, my second son was born and they told me that his head was measuring two weeks, two weeks larger than normal in utero. And then when he was born, his head was measuring 95% larger than normal. And he was getting sick. He's vomiting. He had a seizure. We thought he fainted, but it was a seizure. We kept taking him to the doctors in the children's hospital and they kept misdiagnosing him with a stomach bug. And at about four months, his pediatrician told us, take him to the children's hospital to have MRI, an MRI taken and he'll probably be released the same day. And we just want to do it as a, do it as a precaution because his head, she noticed his head was getting larger than normal since birth. Um, we took him to the children's hospital and they took images and there's a child abuse pediatrician and she said, we found fluid in your child's head and we believe it's non-accidental trauma and that he is a victim of shaken baby sh syndrome. And we were completely in shock. And I told the pediatric neurosurgeon, I told him, you know, my son has never been hurt in any way. Can this be something else such as a medical condition? And he said, yes, but since he's a baby and can't talk, we're just going to go with abuse and walks away. And um, it was what so tough. What state was this in? This was in Texas, in Austin, okay. Texas. Okay. And uh, my child, my, my baby, he was only five months old at the time. So he's laying there in a hospital bed. He had to have two neurological surgeries. Um, the first surgery was to drain the fluid by an external VP shunt and the fluid reaccumulated in a few weeks. And then they had to do another serious brain surgery of placing an internal VP shunt, which goes from his head all the way down to his belly and it helps drain the excess fluid. And so um, a few months later, or CPS showed up at the hospital, they interrogated us. I asked them if we could please speak in another room because my, my baby's lying in the hospital bed. I do not want to have this, this conversation with him there and cause more stress and tension for him because he's already going through that. So CPS um, showed up at the hospital, they interrogated us, I had an attorney there, and they made his father leave the house, they wrongfully accused him, and they they ended up taking my both of him and my oldest son, who was only four months, four years old at the time, so my four-year-old son and my six-month-old baby, CPS showed up at our, our, our uh, we were visiting family at the time, they showed up with the sheriff's. And they just ripped my children out of my arms. My baby was crying and my four-year-old asked, mama, are they going to hurt me? He was really scared. And then um, a few, they, our attorneys fought to have our children placed with family members, but they, the judge said no and said foster care and gave no reason. So that traumatic experience was so hor horrific for my four-year-old son and my baby. My four-year-old son lost 20 pounds within only six weeks of being taken from me. And I was told by Casa that my baby had cried all day in foster care. He missed his MRI um, visit to have images taken and uh, a scheduled visit with the neurosurgery department because CPS kept moving my children within the foster care system. And then about a, a few months later, they wrongfully charged my children's father with two serious felony felonies of injury to a child. 
and he had a top secret government and military security clearance. So he lost his job, lost his clearance. We lost our medical insurance. We ended up having to, um, I called my, my cousin in Los Angeles. She's an attorney. And she told me, I know you and, and their father would never hurt your children. Anyway, you hire your own attorneys and you fight this. So that's exactly what we had to do. We had to sell our house to pay for the mounting attorney fees. We had to hire three attorneys, two attorneys to represent us in family court. And then he had to hire a criminal defense attorney. And attorneys are awesome, but you know, the retainers is like $15,000 or even more each. Some of them, they're a little bit less or more. And it's just, you know, we spent $80,000 to fight for our innocence and to fight for my children, to bring them back home. And it took five months to fight with our attorneys in court to get my children back. And it was, it was such a horrific experience, you know, as a mother, if you could just imagine them ripping your baby out of your arms, placing them in a car and with strangers and you have no idea where they're gonna go or who they're gonna be with. It's it just such a horrific experience. It was like, it was like walking around with a hole in my heart for five months, just not having my children and only seeing them two days a week for only two hours. And in supervised. CPS, <laughs> yes. We had to go to a C- CPS office. There's this glass window where they're watching you and treating you like you're this horrific criminal when you're in fact innocent. And it was such a challenge. Um, I told them I was going to take my son to be correctly diagnosed and I was taking him to many doctors and they didn't, they did not like that. And I believe that's why they wrongfully took my children from me. They did not like that my son was going to different doctors and that I was trying to find the correct diagnosis. We were visiting a different state at the time, and it wasn't that far from where we lived. And that state, uh, CPS got involved, and they said, CPS Texas is telling me to take your children, and I'm going to do my own investigation. So she got involved. She was a supervisor from a different state and CPS. And she said, I deem your children safe. I will not take them from you. They CPS was trying to get the hospital because I took him to that hospital, too. And I said, they're saying they're trying to say my son is immediate danger. Can you please see him? They said, no, he's not hurt. We can't, we can't see him. And we begged. And finally they gave, they gave him, him an exam and MRI and everything. And they're like, he's fine. He's, he's not sick. So then I, I thought that would have been enough proof to them that, you know, our children, my children were safe and, and CPS deemed them safe. And I had the hospital saying that they're, he was healthy and doing well. And they still wrongfully took them from me. And just, just going through that horrific experience, like no, no one understands. I didn't even under, understand how easy this can happen to anyone at any time. And if you, if we fast forward, um, let's see, five months it took to get my children back. CASA is a state, they're, they're a court advocate. So they came in and they said, look, I went into the CPS office and I read your children's files and I found zero evidence of child abuse. So we're going to have this case dismissed. I'm going to request it from the judge. So it took us a year of going to court dates, having CPS constantly in my house, monitoring us. We had to go to uh, child, child, uh, is like child classes, parent parenting classes, something like that. And then we had to do mandatory therapy. We, I had to do a psychological evaluation. There's so many hoops that they make you jump through to get your children back. And they try to keep them within in that system for as long as possible. And my attorney used to be a prosecutor for CPS. And she said, you know, they realized what they did was wrong. That's why they threw your kids back at you so fast. So um, it took two and a half years to have my son correctly diagnosed and two and a half years to have those criminal charges dropped from my children's father. And I ended up finding out that... Um, <clears throat> My children's father had a criminal defense attorney and he's like, hey, let me look through the medical records. You'd be shocked at what you could find in there. So he looks through the records, it took a few months, and then he calls us and schedules a meeting in his office. And he said, look, I know that you are in fact innocent. And we looked at each other. We're like, that's what we've been trying to say for the past two and a half years. And he said, I found in the birth records that your child had a birth injury. I hired a medical expert who has 30 years of experience in neuroscience and neurology. And he confirmed that your child had a birth injury in a condition called benign external hydrocephalus. My son has a life-threatening neurological condition, and yet CPS and the Children's Hospital made false reports of abuse. And it's just, it's so horrific to actually think years later, like, I can't believe we went through this. But so many families, thousands of families are going through this situation nationwide. 
even children, when their children are older and they could speak and they're saying we're not abused, they can make false reports of abuse and take them from you, even when they're older and they, they can speak. And ever since um, 2018, so everything got so much better in 2018. And then I, I took time to try to heal. I took a year to try to heal. And I wrote my book called Miracles of Faith to share our story and raise awareness and hopefully help other families. I've had meetings with over 10 lawmakers in different states, shared my testimony at a legislative hearing at the Capitol building in Austin, Texas. And I fought for changes for two and a half years with families. And we had a law approved that would, that passed. And I think it was in 2021 that would allow parents a second opinion before wrongful and traumatic removal. And ever since then, um, we've been really fighting for changes for the past five years. So many families have been contacting me and saying that they're, they're going through a similar situation. And this is affecting doctors, nurses, people in the military and the government, engineers, attorneys. This is even CPS. It's happening to their own caseworkers. There's a mother that had her babies wrongfully taken from her and she works for CPS. So this is happening to thousands of families across our nation and worldwide. I mean, one group, um, Family Ford Project, there's 19,000 members in there. And then Fractured Families, Innocence Anonymous. There's so many, there's so many groups that I'm in and there's thousands of members in there. And so many people are saying my children have been wrongfully taken. They've been emotionally traumatized. We're all emotionally, tra emotionally traumatized. Please help us. And just the other day, a mother contact me, contacted me and she said her baby has been wrongfully taken and she's a nurse. So this, this is happening so often. People have no idea. And I was, uh, I also volunteered to be in a popular Netflix show called Take Care of Maya. And it's raising so much awareness and we really need this awareness to get out there to continue to, to fight for changes. We need this nation, national awareness. And I strongly encourage anyone that has a child has children, knows people that have children, please watch Take Care of Maya. It's a huge eye opener and it helps raise that awareness to help other families. And hopefully we can continue to fight for changes nationwide. I even know your story and I'm still speechless. It just, it, it just angers me, just infuriates me actually. For the people who are hearing it for the first time, I just have a few questions that might help them also understand the, the intricate details. So going back to the beginning, your son was born with this birth defect. Birth injury. Yes. Birth, was it a birth injury that caused this? Not a birth yes, defect. A birth. So he a was injured injury. during birth. Yes. Okay. So, and because your husband's defense attorney found it in your medical records, the hospital is well aware of this. Yes. So they knew that they had injured your baby during birth and did not tell you. Exactly. Yes. It seems to me as if they were trying to avoid a lawsuit that you had injured. They had injured your baby. Yes. So that's just keeping and, the secret. Yes, exactly. And it's it's really sad because they take doctors take an oath of do no harm. And for my son to have all that fluid accumulating in his head, vomiting, having a seizure, it's it was very dangerous for him. Yes, they said they nothing. They did not tell us anything. They acted really weird at the hospital when he was born, and I couldn't make sense of it. They kept trying to take, make us stay longer than normal. They even called his pediatrician office, and they scheduled an, an appointment for him like a day after, which is not normal because I have another child, and they didn't do that at the other hospital. So they're... Like now thinking back about how everything was, was happening, just something seemed very off. And then years later, I found out that he had a birth injury and it's in the medical records and they did not tell us that he had a birth injury. And, and then go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, if it's in your medical records, this so-called organization that's there to help protect the children, it's right there in your medical records. He was he, due to the hospital's negligence, was born with this injury. Yes. So they overlooked it as well. Yes, we told the children's hospital that his head was measuring too large than normal. Could you please look at our medical records of when he was born? And they said yes, but I strongly believe that they did not. But there's also um, something that I learned a few years ago after going through his medical records again. The children's hospital knew that my son had hydrocephalus because the MRI report said protocol for hydrocephalus. 
And they never told us that he had hydrocephalus at all, not once. So for, and this is when it, everything first happened too. For that MRI to say that, they, the children's hospital knew that he had this medical condition. They hid it from us, didn't tell us anything. And then they make a false report to CPS of child abuse. That was going it's to be my next just, question. Was it the same hospital that injured your baby also took different, your baby? Yeah, it's a different hospital, but they're linked together within the same system. So they can get records and communicate with each other. Well, even and, if they weren't in the same system, they could still get records. That's just. Yes, exactly. And then when this first happened at the children's hospital, the wrongful accusations and everything, there was a nurse that said, hey, I was in the same hospital when your child was born. I remember. And we're just we're just shocked that she didn't say anything. It's just it's just so shocking. You know, doctors take an oath of do no harm. And many doctors did so much harm in the situation. And when I was taking my son to, for a second opinion, doctors were very mean to us. There was one geneticist doctor that said, look, for your child to have this fluid, he had to have been shaken. And I said, no, can you please give my son an exam? He was never hurt in any way. He was not shaken. So the nurses, doctors, they treat us horribly. Like we're this hor these horrible child abusers when my son ha had a medical condition and no one would listen. I took him to so many doctors in Texas and even Oklahoma, geneticists, neuro a neurologist, neurosurgeon, just, it was so difficult to have the proper care for him and the proper diagnosis. And I was really worried about him and I wanted him to have the correct diagnosis so that they can treat him accordingly to whatever he had. And, and the um, doctors knew the whole time and just didn't tell you. Yes, exactly. Do, it, it's just to me, the way I see it, it's money. It's not first, you know, and I'm not saying that there's not great doctors out there. Lord knows we need them. And there are great doctors out there, but there are doctors and there are hospitals that are so driven by the almighty dollar and the greed for it, that they would sacrifice the welfare of a newborn. Let that baby go home and say nothing to an injury they caused during birth, knowing that that child, could your son have died? Yes, as, as a possibility, because the flu the amount of fluid that he had in his head was very dangerous. And we didn't know. We kept taking him to his pediatrician, urgent care, and the ch same children's hospital. And they and all they just dismissed it. Yeah, they just said, oh, he we think he has a stomach bug and he should be fine. But so, um, there was but, Real quick, though, when you were taking him back to the hospital, when you first had him and you understood something wasn't quite right, and you were going to the hospital, and, and was it the same hospital where you delivered? It was the children's hospital that we took him to. Oh, so it wasn't the same one where you delivered? No, it wasn't. That's the, okay. that the birth hospital. And then Not that it matters. I'm just, yeah. just to visualize, get a perspective of the whole thing. I just find this so horrific, disgusting, these doctors that do this, that the doctors, the nurses, everybody involved, for whatever reason, their greed, uh, pressure from above, whatever it was, it was wrong all the way around, but still sent your baby home with a condition they caused, yep. said nothing. You're now going back to try to find out what's wrong with your baby like any mother would. And when you can't get the diagnosis, of course you keep asking. You're trying to save, you're try trying to, there's something wrong. You're not doctor yes. shopping. You're trying to understand what's wrong, which was right there in the medical records. Yes. I, I just, I just find it like just, the gut of my stomach infuriating that they did this to you with intent. Yes. And, and we've contacted um, a malpractice attorney and the laws have changed so much in Texas that he told us it's very, they make it very tough to file these lawsuits and win. So you, you can't help but think, okay, why are all these protections protecting all these doctors and everything, all this malpractice? And why is it so hard to, Yes. Why is it so hard to file lawsuits now when they are wrong? Like, And they know they're wrong. Yes. And even until this day, no one has been held accountable. No one ever told us we, they are sorry. We never got an apology at all. Not even the criminal defense, um, not even the criminal, the judge for the criminal case. No one said they're sorry. CPS never said they're sorry. No one. They just, they just shove it under the rug and act like it never happened. And this is happening to thousands of families across our nation. Oh, they and won't say really, they're sorry because that's an admission of guilt. Yes, exactly. And then the doctors, they'll never, they'll never admit that they were wrong because it would be career suicide. They'd lose their job and they'll, they just will never admit they're wrong. And it's just, 
it's so wrong that oftentimes there no one is ever held accountable for what is happening. And there's so many involved that they know what they're doing is wrong and they continue to do this to children and families. And it's really heartbreaking. Because it makes money. Mother, yes. As a mother to not have my kids for five months was so excruciatingly heartbreaking. I had to pray and lean on my faith for God to give me the strength to get through every day. It was so heartbreaking. And to see my children cry every time I saw them and beg to go home and I couldn't, I felt like my, my hands were tied behind my back and I was pushed up against the wall and I could do nothing to, to help protect my children from the trauma that they had to go through. The same system that says we're doing in the best interest of the children, it's not true. If they were doing what's in the best interest of the children, they would have not put my children through this emotional trauma and heartache for five months, five months. They it's, I don't know exactly what the term would be called, but it's withholding. My attorney said they're, they're withholding your children from you on purpose, knowing that. It's like kidnapping. Had, yes. It's, it's medical kidnapping and, and legally stealing children, legally taking children from their parents. And, and, and there's, and they're making money off of it. This is what's so absurd. They're, they're billing insurance companies for all of this and they know what they did. And there's still, there's so much money involved in this. Now I'm not saying that there aren't really bad people out there that neglect and abuse their children and they should lose their children. If you are doing that to your child or any child, you shouldn't be allowed near kids. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but what's happening to you and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, I don't even know at this point to other families there's profit in that. And there's profit in not coming forward if you've done, if you, meaning doctors, nurses, a facility of, you know, has done something during the childbirth process that causes an injury to say nothing, to avoid a lawsuit. It's all about money. Yes. And, and it's really sad that they build, they put my son through so much testing and MRIs and imaging that was not necessary to check for abuse, even though there was no evidence of any abuse, there was no broken bones, no bruises, nothing. So they ran all these tests and they they racked up our insurance bill, thousands and thousands of dollars. And this is happening so much. And it's just, it's so sad because <clears throat> we understand that children are being abused and we're strongly against that. But on the flip side, the system is abusing our children. They're, they're taking our, they're wrongfully, mis they're misdiagnosing our children with abuse making false reports, these children are emotionally traumatized from being removed from their parents and removed their, from their home, placed with strangers in the foster care system. And they usually stay there for a year, two, three years, however long it takes, however many hoops they make you jump through just to get your child back. It's it's a system that that is severely broken and needs to be fixed. And we, like my attorney said, we really hope that it goes from, I can't believe this is happening to this needs to stop. Because everyone's everyone's uh, um, reaction, even mine, was I can't believe this is happening. But hopefully, with take care the take care of Maya popular doc documentary on Netflix, when people see that, people will be outraged and stop going from I can't believe this is happening to this needs to stop. And that's where that's where we really need this national awareness, and that's what we hope and pray for to continue to fight for changes. And we fought for changes for the past five years, and it's been one heck of a fight. Yes. But the more attorneys and organizations and families that we can get to join with us in this long fight for changes, the more that we can make changes to this horrible system. I, I mean, when I first interviewed you, oh gosh, it seems like forever ago now, I was blown away with how tragic your story was. It was just awful. With that said, I hadn't experienced this. Now, as a mother, I can understand how awful that was for you. I can, I cannot truly understand the depth of your pain because I have not gone through that, but I can understand as a mother, how horrible and it, 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 you, you know, your kids not only be accused of all of this and all the, what happens in the, you know, the, the family, the, the bond, the bond of a family, your husband, everything you're going through jobs, money, but then you have them ripped from your arms. I think it was your front yard or wherever you yeah. were. Yes, we were visiting family and is in our uncle's um, front yard. The you know, you're having the strangers rip your children from your <laughs> arms. It's it's they're it, it, they're being abducted and you can do nothing. Yes. And your story was so awful. I have talked about it and told so many people about it. And then 
when I found out about when we, you know, we've always stayed in touch and I, I truly, truly appreciate that. You know, the new Netflix documentary where you do have a, a, a clip in it where you talk briefly about your story and it just brought it all back to life that this is still happening and it's happening. It's almost to me from my first interview with you and to now watching take care of Maya, where you're a part of that. And I think Netflix did a beautiful, beautiful job with that horrific story. It seems to me that it's gotten worse. It's gotten, there's more financial gain from these hospitals doing this. Yes. And, and this Sandy Smith that was involved in, in Maya's case, what was it, 30 years she's been doing this? And yes, she, she's the, their, the hospital she's doing this in is the top hospital for yeah. taking children away from families. That's, there's no coincidence there. There's yeah. money involved. Yes, for sure. And, and it seems to me that they take these families and they know they're wrong and they can't admit it. They won't admit it. And they prolong these cases to basically bring these families to their knees where they can't afford to fight anymore. And then the fight's suddenly over because they cannot, they do not want to end up in front of a jury because what these hospitals are doing to these families and these children is I just had tears in my eyes from listening to your story, watching the documentary. It's so awful. I strongly suggest everybody, please watch Take Care of Maya. It's brand new net documentary on Netflix. It will rip your heart out. The, the What they have done to this family with intent. Yes. Take Care of Maya was number two in the top 10 movies in the whole United States after only three days of when it was released last week on Netflix and it's, it's gaining popularity. And I'm, I'm so happy that it's drawing this huge awareness. I'm so thankful for the producer and the the producers and the director. They spent four years to make this documentary. And I briefly, very briefly share a little bit about our story at the very end. And I'm so thankful to be a part of such an awesome and amazing documentary. It's so heartfelt and has such a captivating call to action. And we, we really need this awareness to get out there nationwide and worldwide, because that's the thing is it's kept so quiet. People don't know what's happening. People think like, oh, if, if I heard about this in the news, you know, maybe maybe we would realize that this is happening so often. But, no, but it's, it's, it's kept out of the news and everything on purpose. So that's why we try to fight so hard for awareness so that people know this is a huge problem so we can unite and fight for changes together. Yeah. And Maya's story came, that was in Florida. It was yes. John's, John Hopkins, all children's hospital. Yes. Um, and, and, and for people to say, oh, these, you know, these workers, the doctors, they're just trying to do their best. They're just trying to protect children. Mm -mm. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. All I'm saying is hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times over and over and over. That is actually not the case. There is financial gain in this. And Maya suffered, diagnosed several doctors with yes. CRPS, which is complex regional pain syndrome. She was diagnosed by doctors with this. And, yep. and her parents, her mother, who was a nurse and was very versed in the medical field, you know, as you, it's not a common illness. So she did go doctor to doctor. Her daughter was in excruciating pain. She did what any mother would do. There's nothing wrong with that. And the fact that they hold people like you and, and, and this family accountable for trying to find help for your child as some form of doctor shopping and then turn around, then turn around after they take her away mm -hmm. for, for lying about this disease, for making it up. They said she had Munchausen by proxy, which if you don't know what that is, that's when you fake an illness uh, to get it. Yeah. Yeah for someone yeah. else for attention, you know, so they thought the mother was faking this illness that the daughter was going through, even though she was medically diagnosed by doctors, not by her mom, but by doctors, they take her away, say she's lying, tell the daughter that your mom is basically crazy. She's making this whole thing up. And then Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital, the entire time they had their daughter in state custody was billing insurance for the mm -hmm. same disease they said she was lying about. So if you think there's no money in this, yeah. wake up. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I, I really encourage people to do as well as 
contact your insurance companies and, and see what they're billing your insurance. And that can make your case even stronger and hopefully get your children back. And I've also contacted my insurance company to see where the billing is and everything. But the the challenge, though, is that these insurance companies will tell you it's a violation of HIPAA. So you have to have your attorney subpoena the codes that are that the hospital is requesting from the insurance that's it's billing the insurance with these codes. Yeah. And of so course, you, if you, you by law have them, to pay them, but they don't have to tell you what they're. Yeah, you have to get an attorney to subpoena these codes that these hospitals are billing your insurance for. They're saying it's a violation of HIPAA. And I'm like, I'm like, how is it a violation of HIPAA? These are our records. <laughs> this is our insurance. Yeah. We're paying we're paying for insurance, but you can't give me the codes of what the hospital is billing for my child's surgery. It makes no sense. It how is it a violation of HIPAA? It makes no sense. They're like, because oh, we're sorry. So much it's money not- involved. Mm-hmm. That's why it's money. Insurance companies make money. They try to stall you. Hospitals will try to stall you uh, when they're legally wrong. They will try to stall you. They because they've got tons of money. They can drag this out. They don't even care. Yeah. But families don't, and they yes. know that. Yes, and I I spoke with um, a lady in my church, and she, she said, "Lorena, I I was a foster parent." for many years, years ago. And she said, this has been horrible even years ago. And it's continuing to get much and much worse over time. And that's the thing is people don't understand the more that we let this continue to happen, the worse it is getting. And it is getting so bad where people are continuing to contact me so often. And I lost count of how many people that are contacting me. And it's, it's shocking because if the, if the hospital will actually wrongfully accuse their own doctor in the same hospital, and nurses and, and nurse practitioners within the same medical system, it's it's shocking. Like that shows that this can happen to anyone at any time. There's a doctor and his wife nurse in California. They're wrongfully accused of manslaughter and charged. Their children were also wrongfully taken from them. And then they found out the child had a medical condition and passed away from the medical condition. But that's the thing though, too, is they're they're putting there's they're not doing any due process and you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And once all this, the truth comes out that the children are having medical condition, oftentimes a medical condition, oftentimes no one is ever held accountable. The CPS caseworkers are lying and falsifying court documents, lying to the judge, having these children wrongfully removed. Like in my case, they still weren't held accountable till this day. No, and they won't be. That's that's the unfortunate part. They won't be. And that's why they will continue to do it. And now all these years later, there's more and more and more money involved. And it's 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 the root of almost all financial corruption. It's money. There's so much money in the corruption that they have to police themselves to not make as much money. You know what I'm saying? Like the the hospital. If they police themselves and put proper people and don't just randomly take uh, children for the almighty dollar, uh, they wouldn't make as much money. So how do you expect the hospital to police itself to actually make less money? There, there needs to be more oversight for sure. Like the, our, our lawmakers need to put more pressure on CPS to make sure that they are not getting it wrong. Because these are these are lifelong impacts. It's emotional trauma that affects children for the rest of their lives. The parents, it gives them PTSD and we're having to heal for the rest of our lives. I used to get so traumatized from an, an unannounced knock at the door. Just a knock at the door would give me such high anxiety and I would freeze and my heart would race. Because that same knock at the door brought back horrible memories of when CPS and the sheriff took my children from me and ripped them from my arms, put them in a car and drove off. And it's just, I can't stress this enough. Like doctors, they know what they're doing. They take an oath of do no harm. How can they, this continue to happen? It, it makes no sense. CPS caseworkers, you're, you're supposed to do what's in the best interest of the children. Why are children that are being abused left in homes where they're continuing to be abused? And yet children like my son, who has zero evidence of any child abuse, why were they taken from me? It makes no sense. Why weren't those resources used for, that were used on my children, hundreds of thousands of dollars, why were not, why were those resources used on a child that's actually being abused? Why not rescue that child? Instead, they're taking children that are not being abused 
and they're funneling and funneling them through the foster care system. And it's, it's really, really heartbreaking and sad. And my heart breaks for Maya and her family. And I pray that they will see justice someday because the same it's, it's so crazy because everyone that has been through this situation, they're saying, Oh my gosh, watching take care of Maya. It was the same exact events that happened to me, even with us as well. Same exact events. It's, it's the same thing that continues to plague so many families across our nation, thousands of families and even worldwide. People have contacted me in so many states, California, Arizona, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, New York, Colorado, Air, um, Washington. It just like I've lost count of so many families that have contacted me, even in even in different countries, the UK, India, Norway, Australia. They continue to contact me from different countries as well. This is a huge worldwide problem that needs to stop and we need to stand, unite and fight for changes together. Because if people think this can't happen to them, I, I was also thinking that it can never happen to me until it did. And it's I, I, happened to yeah. so many families. This is this is what's so remarkable is that it's happening more often. Um, and thank God, Maya's mother. Uh, documented everything. She documented everything. Video, mm -hmm. recorded yep. phone calls. She brought, videoed every doctor's appointment. Thank goodness her the one doctor that did actually uh, diagnose her, he videotaped it, his, his own um, yes. doctor visits. But I'm telling you, parents out there, if you think there's something wrong with your children, videotape everything, write yes. down every single person document. you speak to, yes. document, document, record phone calls. Some laws you're allowed to record without saying it. Some aren't. I would check your state. Ask your doctor, ask the nurses. I'd like to record this conversation, you know, get their approval. But it's because of her. Oh, my gosh. Just her relentless fight yes. for the truth and to d just uncover what's happening to her daughter. It's all that documentation that is given the family so much indisputable evidence of what was actually going on that the hospital cannot lie about because yes. they will lie. And, and listening to the parents like you at the end saying, you know, they were, you know, you seeing so many doctors or, you know, their, their son had a seizure, their son passed out or their daughter, this happened and they run to the emergency room because that's what you're supposed to do. Call an ambulance, go to the ER. And then you find out you get there terrified, trying to figure out what's happening to your child. And it's there that they take them away from you. So when you talk about your PTSD, it has to affect you if your child is even sick. Do you even want to see a doctor? It, I would hesitate. I can't, I can't. I can't go. I can't go to the hospitals, doctors, offices, like anything. It used to affect me so bad that just being in, just getting my hair cut because the chairs are lined up and remind me of the oh. doctor's office. So many things. Just seeing a police officer drive their car away, I get such high anxiety. I And I've been working through healing from that for years. My son, he's he was four at the time, now he's 12. He's terrified to go to the doctors because CPS took him, vaccinated him, gave him so many shots, and he's just traumatized by the whole experience. He's like, I, I can't stand going to doctors. Like it's it I'm like, okay, I know we'll work on this. We'll 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 continue to heal. It takes years to heal from, and these are lifelong impacts that will affect us for the rest of our lives. So and, is that is that your oldest, your older son at the time that this all yes. happened? How, how is your young, younger son that this actually happened to you? How has it affected him? He, he still has an internal VP shot and I was talking to him about it and it, it makes him really angry. And he's like, mama, I can't believe they took us from you and you fought for us. And I was like, yes, I, I fought every day for five months to get you back. And he's like, I can't believe this is, this keeps happening. I'm so glad you're fighting for other families because it's so sad that this continues to happen. And he's only eight years old. And my 12 year old s says the same thing. He's like, I'm so glad you're fighting for changes, mama, because this needs to stop. They should be very proud of their mama. You're a strong <laughs> woman. You are a very strong, all the families out there that are going through this and that are fighting um, are, are strong. Keep the strength, keep the faith. Um, we're pulling for you. Those who are still incarcerated on these false accusations, just let, let, let some good news come your way to, to hold the people accountable, to put you back with your families, to try to get your lives back. I mean, families lose neighbors, friends, other family members that, that believe maybe this could be true. You know, it's just a, 
awful, awful cycle of psychological abuse that continues for the rest of your lives. Yes. It's so, it's so concerning and it's just so, um, it's, it's so heartbreaking that it made me realize how many children are in the foster care system, like my own children were, and they should not be there. And they're crying themselves to sleep at night. Like my son was and losing so much weight because they miss their parents and they would just desperately want to go home. And then I think about the, the families that have contacted me recently, they've been wrongfully convicted of child abuse and they're in fact, innocent. And that's and on their Tanya, record. Yes. Tanya, like she's in Tennessee. She was oh, wrongfully convicted. Me. Yes. Wrongfully convicted of 16 years in prison and her, she has two young daughters and she's trying to appeal it, but she is wrongfully convicted and she's sitting in prison and could be there for 16 years. And she's in fact, innocent. There's doctor's reports stating that her, that the child that she's wrongfully accused of abusing ha, did, was not abused. And she still was wrongfully convicted of child abuse. And her two young daughters are so heartbreaking, heartbroken, having to grow up without their mother. And it's affecting her being in prison and she's innocent and it's making her very sick and ill and so stressed out. And my heart and my prayers go out to this family. And Sean, Sean Crawl, he's in Missouri. He was also wrongfully convicted of abuse from his son and his son has ehlers danlos syndrome. And it, it's just shocking. Like how in the world can they be wrongfully convicted of child abuse when they are, there's like five experts saying they were never abused. The, the judicial system, like my children's father, he had, he has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And he's like this system, I used to believe in it and have faith in it. And it failed me and our family immensely. It's, it's just, you can't, it's so shocking that this is continuing to happen and, and they're getting away with it with so many children and families. We're terrified to take our children to the hospital and do these children, children's hospitals because these child abuse pediatricians they say that they're they're they are experts, but they are not experts because my well, this is I'm not saying they're not experts. What I'm saying is my um, my children's medical expert said that the child abuse pediatrician in your case was not properly trained or qualified to read his images correctly. If she was, then she would have been able to correctly diagnose him herself, and she did not. She said it was non-accidental non trauma. We believe it was shaken baby syndrome. And then we hired a medical expert that it took two and a half years to find. Because when you're going through this situation, you don't know what a medical expert is and that you have to hire them or where they are, who they even are. <clears throat> he confirmed that our child had a birth injury and a condition called benign external hydrocephalus. And many families that are going through this, they don't know that they have to hire a medical expert and they don't even know where to turn. Like, how do we even find these medical experts? They're really tough to find. That's but if you're even going to fight. A lot of them yes. tell them to take the, the case plan, you yes. know, jump through all these hoops, go through all this counseling, um, which just prolongs getting your child back. But they tell you at the end, you'll get your child back if you do A through Z, which is going to take forever and all the trauma and everything involved in that. But they're good about it because if you go through yes. that Case, case uh, plan, case plan, therapy, whatever, whatever, you know, the hoops, I just call it the hoops. You, yeah. you forfeit your right to then go after the hospitals and doctors legally. So they try to make that case plan sound really good because while you're going through the case plans, why it's so dragged out, they're making so much money off of your child. And they're and trying to make it more reasons they, to keep them in the system. Yes. Yeah. But if you defy going through the case plan, which is the only way you can maintain your legal right to sue these people, you may not get your kids back. It, yeah, it, it's, they it's, do this on there is when there is money, there will be corruption, stupid human tricks. It's the way of the world. It's what's going to happen. And, and until they take the money out of this, the, the, the financial reward for this corruption, it's not going to change. Yes. You know, we yes. say, you know, bring, bring it to light, bring it to light. Let people know. Uh, yeah, we can let people know, but until that corruption element is taken out, the financial element, people, people's, when dollar signs speak, nobody else matters. Yes. Some, some um, families are having their parental rights terminated through the court system and they lose their children forever to non-family members. And it's just so heartbreaking that this continues to happen. And that's why we, I turned my pain into purpose and tried to help 
I'm trying to help so many other families. I have empathy and I, I really care about these families and I really want to help them, but it's, it's so tough because there's so many of them, even an organization that was helping families. She's like, you know, we're helping one, two, 10, a hundred families, but then behind them, there's hundreds of more. So we're, we're so exact, like we're all volunteering all of our, all of our time and everything. And it's just, we're not eating or, and sleeping at night because it affects us. You know, we feel so bad and our heart breaks for these families and these children. And it's just so tough. It's one heck of a fight for changes. And that's why we really need this awareness to get out there. And I thank you so much for letting me share our story and helping us raise that awareness mm -hmm. because people need to know that this is happening and we need to fight for changes because this can easily happen to anyone's children that's watching anyone that, you know, this, this hits so close to home. Like get this, this hits so close to home that my cousin sent me a message and she said, my friend that is all the way across the United States, she's on the West coast. My friend that's on the East coast, this is happening to her as well. And I was shocked because this is my cousin's friend. Like it, it hits, hits that close to home and it happened to us too. And it's continuing to happen. So we need to stand and unite and fight for changes together. It's so important. There's, there's organizations, there's attorneys, and there's families that are fighting for changes together. And we really need this to stop. Oh, one thing that I, cause I, you were saying something and then I lost my train of thought and now I remember what it was. I'm finding that I spoke with an attorney and he said that when a child is wrongfully removed by CPS, it's violating their fourth amendment in the federal court system. And when a child abuse pediatrician looks at the children's medical records, they're violating their 14th amendment. Therefore, he just won on one of his federal cases stating that a federal judge actually granted this ruling that made it so that the child abuse pediatrician does not have qualified immunity, which sets precedence for other families, which is huge. Yes. So parents, parents don't know that the children usually have a longer statute of limitations because within our, within our situation, they knew that the statute of limitations in Texas is only two years. So they kept filing extensions to make it go to two and a half years for criminal court. And then for our children, they were just hoping that we wouldn't know what really happened. And that two year statute of limitations went up for me as, as, as their parent too. But for children, they have a, about in every state it's different, but usually it's about 18 years of a statute of limitations where their, their parents can file these federal lawsuits on behalf of the children. That's fantastic. That's yes. That's, see, this is why the word, the word needs to continuously go out because there's so many families out there right now that have no idea. They're not the yes. only ones. Yes. No one thinks that this is happening anywhere else. I had not, like I said, I'd never heard of it until I had spoken with you and I interviewed you. And, and what happened to your family. So other families out there are, they believe, they feel that they're alone. But what you just said, that there's a whole law out there that doesn't cut you off at two years, uh, that allows these children 18 years uh, to, to file, a lawsuit, yes. file a lawsuit to recoup some form of damages for what these people have done to their, to them, to their families, their future. Don't forget these babies will have babies one day and they won't want to take their babies to the hospital. This is just an awful, awful cycle of abuse and, and corruption that, that has to stop. And the word needs to get out to yes, to let people know, to empower these organizations and these victims, victims like you to, to come forward. And for people like us that have not gone through this to help you support yes. you in, as you come forward, but also to, to, to stop it, to, to, to share this story, these stories. So these people who feel that they're alone, aren't alone and everybody just power in numbers and it, oh, it's just awful. And I know you, you, you've fought, Lord, yes. have you fought, you've changed laws. Um, and I will link everything that was said today below us in the show notes. Um, your beautiful book that you wrote about for, you know, what had happened to you, all the different laws that you have fought for, uh, the different changes that you have made, links to the Netflix, to your blogs that you write about. Everything that you're yeah. doing to just you are relentless on trying to keep the public aware of what is truly going on all around us. Yes, it, it is such a an exhausting fight for changes, to be honest. And there's so many people that have given up or want to give up. But I get courage and strength through fear, through my faith and prayer. 
And God gave me the strength to get through every day that I didn't have my children. I can't explain the emotional heartache. And it it's as a parent, you feel like you're walking around with a hole in your heart and something is missing. And the amount of grief and pain every day that I didn't have my children is so unexplainable. There was, there were days where I'd pray and ask God to give me the strength to just put one foot and step in step in front of the other and be strong enough to fight for my children because I was so sad without my kids. I can't even explain it. A mother called me a few days ago crying. She's like, they, they have my baby and I'm so heartbreak broken. And I was just like, I'm so sorry you're going through this. You stay strong and you take care of yourself. Your baby needs you to fight for her. And she's like, I can't, I don't want to eat. I can't sleep. I'm so heartbroken without my baby. And my heart breaks for these families and people have no idea that this is happening so often and it can easily happen to anyone anytime. And that's why we really need this awareness. Please watch our Netflix movie, Take Care of Maya. It's so popular now on Netflix. And I'm so thankful for all the positive comments and feedback from everyone and for everyone saying, you know, thank you for sharing your story. It was so powerful at the end. And we just, we really thank the producers and the director for making this because we really need this na national worldwide awareness to continue to fight for changes. And we also have a petition that has 250 signatures right now in only a few days. And we ask you to please, please sign our petition to stop families and in, in hospital, to stop hospitals and CPS from wrongfully removing and, and causing so much emotional trauma for the children. Please sign our petition and please reach out to us. If you can join our fight, if you could get news stations involved, that's what we're really trying to get is some national news stations involved. That would really help to get our story on the news and just nationwide. Maya's um, Take Care of Maya was also on the cover of People Magazine, which was awesome recently. And it's right here on the cover of People Magazine. We're so thankful for all of this awareness. It was on USA Today. Just even if you Google Take Care of Maya, you'll see so many media outlets are sharing about it, which we're so thankful for. We really need this awareness. I can't stress that enough to continue to fight for changes. Yes. And links to everything, everything that was spoken about today will be underneath us in the show notes. It'll be one click away, the petition, mm -hmm. the documentary, uh, Lorena's blogs, the People magazine, uh, some clips that Lorena was kind enough to share with me. All of that will be below us in the show notes so you can have access to everything. And please share, watch, sign the petition. This could be yes. your son, your daughter, your child. Um, next. It truly, it, th this crosses racial lines, religious lines. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It does not matter. It. This has hit families from all four corners. And right down the middle, it does not matter. Yeah, Shannon, one mother, she spent a million dollars in attorney fees to fight for her daughter. And she still had her parental rights terminated and she lost her daughter forever. People have no idea how much of a fight this is. We lost our house. We had to sell our house to pay for attorney fees. We had to max out credit cards, get loans, family donated. And even though this happened in 2015, we're still paying almost $700,000, almost $700 a month every month and we still have like two two and a half years to go to pay off all of the attorney fees that we had to, we accumulated to hire three attorneys to to fight for us families are are claiming bankruptcy we almost had to claim bankruptcy a few times there's a family that i know that did have to claim bankruptcy because of all of the attorney fees like people have no idea once you once you hire your own attorneys to fight for you, you and you have to you need to you need to find the best attorney you can to fight for you and your in your children because you can lose your children forever. But it's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars and there's no one is ever being held accountable until hopefully now. And it's so hard to get everything that we lost back. Like I will never get those five months back that I lost with my sons. It was it was such a horrific experience. That's that's why we hope to turn our pain into purpose and try to help other families and children because this needs to stop. It really needs to stop. Do you have any more um, speaking, any more places where you're going to go to try to change laws, make new laws? What's 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 next for you? We, re we really hope that there can be a federal law, that the, the same the law that was passed in Texas that would allow parents a second opinion before wrongful and traumatic removal of their children. We really hope that it will be a federal law and within all the states in the United States someday. 
And it's, it's really tough because, but we, we really need that awareness and that's way, that way we could continue to fight for changes. When families contact me in various states, uh, such as Missouri, families were cont- contacting me from there. I was calling senators and state representatives requesting meetings. We actually did have a meeting with some state represent with a senator and a state representative, and we're speaking to them. And that's that's why I can't stress enough is con- please contact your senators and state representatives. Put pressure on them. Tell them, demand, we need changes. We need to help these children and families. And our lawmakers, just like in Texas, they've been fighting for changes. And even though that law passed, there's still so much work to be done because this is continuing to happen. Yeah. And and we really need to band, to unite together and fight for changes. We can't stress that enough. And, and also, I, I contacted a national reporter, and I'm really hoping that she can get our story on the news nationwide because we really need the news stations to help us. We really need, because nothing changes if we stay quiet. And if these news stations can help us raise awareness and share our stories, it would really help so much because the reporters and everyone within these news stations, it can happen to their children too. And how would they feel if this happened to their children? They would want it to go public as well. So we really hope that these news stations will get on board and help share our stories as well and talk about Maya and her family and the Take Care of Maya documentary. It's such a powerful documentary on Netflix and I can't stress this enough if you have children if you know anyone that has children, please encourage your family and friends to watch Take Care of Maya on Netflix. It's such a, it's a heartfelt, captivating documentary that, that we really need this awareness. And, and Netflix did such a beautiful job. It is not, it's not, it's, it, it's not done in a way to make it seem worse than it really is. It is truly yeah. as is, it's as real as it gets, Yes, um, which what makes it so horrific is it's just real. And um, we could talk all day about it. I really just want people to watch it. It's worth, it is worth it. I've already watched it twice. Um, It is very, honestly, it's, it's that informative and it's that well done that. um, Yeah. I've watched it twice. Everybody after you hear this after you're done watching Go to Netflix, take care of Maya. It will it, it it will change the way you see everything that happens in a hospital. Yes. My dad called me from Hawaii because my dad's from Hawaii and he's like, I can't believe this is happening. I'm like, Dad, I, I we went through it too. And he's like, Yeah, this this needs to stop. But going back now, you know, we know that you have fought and continuous to fight to change the laws, which I think it's absurd that you actually have to get a law on the books. You have to fight for a law to get on the books for a parent to get a second opinion on their child's medical diagnosis, let alone to get that second opinion because you're about to have your children taken away. That just, it yes. that just seems stupid. <clears throat> that that should yeah. already exist. The fact that you have yeah. to fight for that to get, to have ma- that law made is absurd. Definitely. Yeah, I asked the children, the same children's hospital that misdiagnosed my son with abuse. I asked them for a second opinion. And they said, no, we don't think that's necessary. And then if you want to take your child out of that hospital and take him for another opinion, they take custody of your child, the state does. And they don't, they prevent it from happening because they want that. They want you to continue to keep seeing the doc, seeing the doctors that are saying the child's being abused, even though they know that they're not. Because yeah. there's money. I mean, your beautiful book, um, your blogs, everything that you're doing. Um, I cannot encourage everybody enough to, to read through it, to, 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 you know, you are a remarkable woman. You are so strong and, and so incredible. You even tell everybody about pure, you, you started this whole line, just, was it more therapeutic for you? Was it to, you know. Tell everybody about that. Yes, definitely. I'm the owner of Pure Beauty Bay Lorena and going through this whole experience, lighting candles was really to help me de-stress and rejuvenize and just be calm. And I found that um, seven years ago, I was lighting a candle at home and it's a store-bought candle and I was getting a sore throat headache and I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on until I researched the ingredients in that candle. And I found that most candles are made from paraffin wax and paraffin is derived from petroleum. 
and carcinogens are released into the air that can cause lung cancer, asthma, and heart problems. So then um, seven years ago, that's when I started making my own 100% natural Soax candles and and um, people are loving her since they're natural. They don't release any carcinogens or toxic chemicals into the air. And they're just relaxing and soothing. And even now I have one right here sitting in at the end of the day, you know, I'm a busy mom and I'm fighting for changes and going through so many things in a day. I really love to just light a candle and relax and, and it helps me de-stress in it. And the atmosphere of a lit candle at night, it just really helps me to just calm be calm and yeah and it's just it really helps to just at the end of a stressful day it really helps you to stay calm and, and relax and rejuvenated you are remarkable Lorena you are absolutely remarkable it, it's Thank to you. say you're tireless and fearless I know you get tired and I know you <laughs> faced fear but you really um if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't know any of this. I wouldn't even know about the Netflix documentary series. So you've opened up my world to a world I wish didn't exist. Um, and it is an honor for me to take your story, help you try to get it out there, talk about this brilliantly done horrific story um, about Maya, take care of Maya, um, to help get that word out because we, we all have to help each other. We all have to be there we, to, to support each other. Even if it's never happened to me, I feel like at least I could try to do my part to help, you know? Thank you. Just thank you. You're so awesome too. And I thank you so much for sharing our story and helping us spread that awareness that we really need to get out there. It's. And my, my strength, my strength, honestly, my strength and courage comes from God because through, through, through prayer and faith, God helped me get through the most heartbreaking and worst times of my life. And he's helping me to continue to fight for these families because it's one exhausting fight, but he gives me the strength and energy to keep going and keep fighting. Well, I hope that from the strength that you've received from your prayers, that these families that so desperately need that strength as well, that are just at the beginning of their fight, maybe years into their fight, still in jail, fighting that they're empowered as well through prayer, through, through help, yes, through support you. from all of us, that they, they, they feel that energy, that, that help, that support, that light at the end of the tunnel to just keep striving, just keep fighting. Yes. I encourage everybody, whatever you're going through in life, if it's this or anything, just stay strong and never give up and never lose hope. Because there were so many days where I didn't feel like I had strength and I wanted to give up. And I just, the heartache of not having my children was so immensely painful. I can't even explain it. But I had to pray for God to just give me the strength to put one foot in front of the other, to just make myself food, to keep going, to keep fighting for my kids. And God gave me the strength to get through it. And he could do the same for you too. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you. Thank you. My heart and my prayers go out to all these families, to Maya and her family and to everyone that's going through a situation or any situation that ever that anyone's going through. Just please stay strong, keep fighting and never give up, never lose hope because things can get better. We're in the worst storm of our lives for two and a half years. It felt like this huge tornado just came in and destroyed our lives and we we're left with having to pick up the pieces. Like so many families are going through this too. But I encourage everyone to please stay strong and never give up. Stay strong.